going to be in the uh, last chapter of Joshua, if you've got your Bibles. Joshua 24, last book. There was a uh, backyard neighbor funeral. Mr. Green peered over his fence and noticed that the neighbor's little boy was in his backyard filling a hole. Curious about what the youngster was up to, Mr. Green asked, What are you doing, Jimmy? Tearfully, little Jimmy replied, My goldfish died and I've just buried him. That's an awfully large hole for a goldfish, isn't it? Mr. Green said. Patting down the last bit of earth, little Joey replied, That's because he's in your cat. <laughs> We're going to talk about burying uh, some things today. And I uh, want to start off with that story for you this morning. Joshua 24. Before we get into that, just a question. What on earth am I here for? Rick Warren made that popular statement uh, many years ago, but it's a great question. What on earth am I here for? Lots of people give lots of different answers to that. But why are we on God's green earth? Why are we here? What is our purpose? It's, it's really a, a question of not only origin, but of purpose. God placed us here for some reason. Maybe you've heard of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It's from the Reformed Church. This came out in 1644. There are 107 questions. My roommate from college got into the Reformed Church, Presbyterian Church, and he taught his children the Westminster Shorter Catechism. He would ask the question and his children would give the answer. 107 questions of catechism. And the first question is, what is the chief end of man? And his kids would reply, answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Why are we here? We're here to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's a good answer. We're going to see that in the scriptures that lie ahead here. Um, who do you serve? I want to, before I get into Joshua, just this thought, Satan comes to Jesus in Matthew 4.10 and he tempts him. He tempts Jesus. And Jesus replies to the temptation and says, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Thinking about our main reason for being on this earth, we are here to worship and serve God. To worship, to adore him, to give our life in worship to him. But how do we do that? It's in service to him and to others. We show our worship, not just in singing songs here with our vocal cords, but when we leave this place, we go and we serve those around us. So we worship and we serve him. They're one and the same thing. When we're serving other people, we're worshiping God. When you're changing that dirty diaper in the middle of the night for your spouse so that your spouse can sleep, you are worshiping the Lord. Isn't that an interesting thought? Now, that's just a mundane task. No, we are serving the Lord with all that we're doing. This word worship is used 16 times in this one chapter. And I, I wanted to say that before I get into the text so you can look for it with me. Abad is the Old Testament word and lutreo is the New Testament word. It's used to serve, to worship, to worship, to serve. Back and forth it goes, okay? So let's go to Joshua 24. We begin with verses 1 through 4 and then we'll skip down a little bit there. Joshua here at the end of his life. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before, not God, they presented themselves before God. So Joshua called them together, and they all came, and they presented themselves to God. I call the church to come and worship together, to worship the Lord, but we come to present ourselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, there's that wording, and all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, long ago your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the river. That's the Euphrates River. And they worshiped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the river and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I signed the hill country of Seir, to Esau, but Jacob 
and to his sons went down to Egypt. Now skip on down to verse 14. Verse 14. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your forefathers that they worship beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord." Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God Himself who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed the great signs before the, our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because He is our God. Verse 19. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people and there at Shechem, he drew up for them decrees and laws. This is serious, folks. Look at 26. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you were untrue to your God. God is asking something of his people here in this. He's asking for covenant renewal. They've come out of Egypt, Africa. They've gone across the Red Sea on dry ground, and they've traveled in the desert for how many years? Forty years. They've traveled around. And now they're coming into the promised land, the land with a lot of milk and honey, cattle and bees. <laughs> there's a lot of milk and honey, so that means there's got to be a lot of bees and a lot of cattle. It's a land flowing with goodness for them. And God brings them out and he brings them into this promised land. And the first thing Joshua does, he calls them all together. Hey, call everybody together. Get all your family, your friends, your neighbors, every clan. Get them all in here, everyone. So the leaders go out and they get them all together and they bring them in for what purpose? Covenant renewal. Why would they need to renew the covenant? Because they have broken the covenant. So all the people gather. They all stand before Joshua, and he must be yelling out to them. And they probably have different leaders out a little bit further, and they hear what he said, and they shout it out to that group. And then there's another guy further on out, and he shouts it to his people group, and they get this all out. They don't have amplification like we do. So they're shouting it out, and the, the law is going forth. The people are listening to Joshua as he proclaims this, but it's all the people. It's all the people. It's every one of them. Nobody got to miss nor did they want to. So they're all there and they're listening to Joshua as he talks to them. Sometimes it's like calling a family together. Sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes things can go awry in your home. Families with little kids in your house. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> it's like everything is going wrong. Uh, kids are breaking things. They're punching each other. They're, they're lying. They're stealing. They're cheating. They're, they're trying to take over the home from you. And you have to say, wait, whoa, 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 who left you in charge? And you have to call the family, everybody come in here, come in here, come here. Everybody sit down, give me your phones, turn everything off, turn the TVs off, look at me, look at me, look at me. <laughs> you get their attention, right? And you, you kind of lay it down the law again. And then what? It's all going really well for maybe a week at the most. And what happens? 
it all starts over again. You know what I'm talking about, parents? Grandparents, you remember? <laughs> and you have to, you have to give a no, whole new bath. You got you to give him another bath. You got to tell him again. And I think that's what Joshua is doing. He's laying it out and he's saying, this is the law. You guys are not fulfilling it. You want God's blessing? Follow the law. You want God's curses? Go ahead with your own way. He's, he's laying it out before them. Verses 14 through 15, he's 110 years old. Look at verse 14. 15. This is what he says. He says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Who is his house? It's all of his is he and his wife and their kids and their grandkids and their great-grandkids and their great-great-grandkids and their great-great-great-great-grandkids. If you're 110 years old, how many grandkids do you have? So he's got his whole group of people and he's 110. <clears throat> All right, guys, listen up here. We're going to follow the Lord. They're like, what Grandpa say? They say we're going to follow the Lord. Shh, don't disrespect Grandpa. I mean, he was a patriarch for them, a patriarch of his family. Think about that. He called all of his generations together. He's 110 years old. If you were 110, how many sets would you have? You think about that. You could have quite a few grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, great-great-great-grandchildren. We're following the Lord. Who made that decision, little kids? Nope. Joshua did. Dads, moms, don't wait on your kids to lead you spiritually. Don't wait on your grandkids to lead you spiritually. You, grandpa, you, grandma, you say to your family, we will serve the Lord. Well, that doesn't seem right. I mean, doesn't everybody have their own rights and privileges? Well, no, I guess not. In the faith family, a grandpa can say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, if you go on your own way, you're going to suffer the consequences. But Joshua says, for me and my household, we will we choose to serve the Lord. And I think they probably did. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is a beautiful picture. You can put this in your home. You can put these up on your walls. This reminder that we will serve the Lord. Your children need to know that that's your idea. Your grandkids need to know that you will serve the Lord. This is your idea. You need to put it before your kids that you're following after him. As the family goes, so goes the church. Our nation can be very weak, and I would say it's because the churches are weak. Judgment will begin in the house of the Lord, not in the White House. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. If it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly? But the idea is that it starts in the church. Everybody says, we need prayer in school, we need prayer in school, and yes, we do, and as long as there are tests, there will always be prayer in school, Right? But we need prayer in the church. We need to devote ourselves, not just in this building, but in our homes, to devote ourselves to prayer. As the family goes, so goes the church. You want a strong church? We need to have strong families. You want to have strong families? You need strong marriages. To have strong marriages, I believe you need strong men. I believe you need strong men. I'd say 95% of the time when a couple is sitting before me for counseling, it's the man's fault. Now, it sounds terrible, I know. That's just my humble opinion. And all the women are going, yeah, and all the men are going, shh. But I'm telling you, if men will lead spiritually, their wives will gently follow. So men, rise up and lead. Lead your families. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, not all men will do that. So we need strong women who will say, if my husband doesn't do it, I will. I will lead my family to the Lord. My wife and I knew a, a young lady. She was a single mom. Her husband had left her. This has been 15 years ago at least. And this woman was very quiet, almost very mousy, just very quiet, small. She was petite. She seemed very simple. And her husband left her, and she cried and cried and cried and wanted to work it out, but her husband left her. And she was so distraught. I remember talking to her. I was the children's pastor at this time, and I remember talking to her, and I said, you know what? You must say to your family, we will serve the Lord. Dad's doing his own thing. We want him back, but until he comes back, we're going to continue to serve the Lord. He never came back. He left her for other people, never came back. And this woman remained single the whole time I knew her, and she kept bringing her kids to church. She brought them on Wednesday night. She brought them on Sunday morning. She brought them on Sunday night. We had children's activities. 
She brought her kids to those activities. She'd come in. Sometimes she'd see tears down her cheeks as she'd bring them in. She'd had a rough morning. But she brought her kids to church. She made a commitment. We will serve the Lord. Was it easy? No. She needed all kinds of help and support and love. But women, you can do this too. The call is on you. If, if a husband checks out and he's gone, you lead your family for the Lord. Look at verses 16 through 24. This whole idea of Joshua pretty much just says, uh, God led you out of here into this nice place, but you can't keep it. Well, what do you mean, Joshua? Yes, we can. We can do this. Joshua said to the people, you're not able to serve the Lord in verse 19. <laughs> but look what they say in verse 21. But the people said to Joshua, no, no, we will serve the Lord. The Bible says to provoke one another to righteousness. Do you like to be provoked? <laughs> I don't. Do you ever get provoked by things? The Bible says, provoke one another to righteousness. I think Joshua is kind of provoking them to righteousness. You guys can't do this. They're all like, whoa, we can't do this? Yes, we can. No, we will serve the Lord. I don't know if that still works today. Brockington Road, you can't. You can't serve the Lord. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Can you serve the Lord? Of course you can. With all of your heart. Amen. Serve him. 25 to 26. I want to focus in on this for just a moment. On that day, Joshua made a covenant. He wrote it down. He, he wrote these things down in the, the law of God, the book of the law of God. And then what did he do? He set up a large stone there by the tree in Shechem. This, this, this stone, it was to be a reminder See these things down here in front? We, we don't use them as much anymore because of all this crazy COVID stuff. But, but these are altars. They used to be called mourner's benches in the old days. They were just wooden benches, and people would come, and they would sit on them, or they would drape themselves over them in these old, days of old, and they would weep and cry, and they would confess their sin. They're called mourner's benches. That's why they would sit on them. They would come down to confess their sin before God. We have altars to remind us of commitments we've made to the Lord. We stand before altars to get married. We stand before altars to dedicate our children to the Lord, which we'll see here in just a moment. We stand before the, these altars to make all kinds of covenants to follow after God. Maybe you've fallen away into sin and the preacher has an altar call and you come forward and you say, I'm going to drive this stake down in the ground. I will follow God. And you don't give up. No matter what comes your way, I drove that down. I settled it right there at the altar. You know, we don't hear this term anymore, but remember the old term, praying through? Man, he, he prayed through. What does that mean? That means he prayed and he prayed until he got the victory in Jesus. And there are times that you've got to pray and pray and pray as a dad, as a mom, for your family. And you stay at it and you stay at it and you stay at it. No, we will serve the Lord. And you drive down a stake. Families, have you done that? You can't be wishy-washy. This world will take you downstream pretty fast. Drive a stake down, dads, moms. No, we will serve the Lord. We will not listen to that kind of music in our home. We will not watch that kind of programming in our home. We will not use that kind of language in our home. No, we will serve the Lord. Where are the dads that are strong enough to do that today? Where are the moms that are strong enough? We need families that are strong. Strong families make strong churches. We want a stronger church? Work on your marriage. Want a stronger church? Work on your kids. Want a really strong church? I need to work on me. Work on yourself, right? Verse 27. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are unto our, your God. Remember Jesus is riding in on a donkey, the triumphal entry, and they're crying out in praises, and the Pharisees say, Jesus, tell them to stop. And Jesus said, if they're silent, the rocks will cry out. The rocks have heard all of the promises of God throughout the ages and their witnesses to us and against us at times. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I want to camp on this for just a moment before we close. There are life benefits of regular church attendance. There's a man by the name of Neil McQueen who did great research on this, and he looked at the life benefits of regular church attendance. 
you go, Phew, I'm so glad we're here this morning. We're going to see some of the benefits of us being here. Here they are. I'm going to give you a few of them. Significantly reduce your child's use and risk from alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. That's what the stats show. Dramatically lower their risk of suicide. When you bring your kids to church, here's what you do. You, you help them rebound from depression 70% faster. You improve their attitude at school and increase their school participation. You reduce their risk for rebelliousness. Bringing your kids to church, you reduce the likelihood that they will binge drink in college. You provide them with a lifelong moral compass. You provide children with a caring extended family. This is interesting. This was in the stats, and he put it down. You get them to wear their seatbelts more often. That was in there. They're just smart citizens. They're good citizens. And then lastly, it will also statistically improve their odds that they will lead an active church life in their adult years. Benefits of regular church attendance. What is regular church attendance? <laughs> There's probably as many answers as there are people. Here's my humble opinion. Come to church every week. That is regular church attendance. God created Six days, he worked six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. He sanctified the day. That's a day for families. You know what? We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to be in church. You can't just serve the Lord all the time and never go to church. You serve the Lord by coming to church to worship him. That's just practical stuff for you families. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, listen, that is not a promise from God. That is a proverb. That is a probability. Uh, my parents raised me to know the Lord. Um, I don't know if they'll listen to this online or not, but I've done a lot of dumb things in my life. I've done a lot of stupid things in my life. I've done a lot of sinful things in my life. There are some things that I might be able to be in jail for in my life. My parents raised me. My parents raised me in church. They raised me to know the Lord. And guess what I did? I chose to do some dumb things on my own. So this is a probability. It's not a promise. So don't get that confused. This is not a promise from God. This is a probability. We all know people who have raised their kids in church and their kids go off and they're gone. And we say, well, God's word must not be true. No, this is a probability. It's a proverb. Don't get it confused with a promise. Most of the time, odds are, if you raise your kids in church, they will not depart from it. Now, the Hebrew talks about when they get old. I don't know. The idea means stubble on their face when they're old. Peach fuzz. When they start to grow a beard. Puberty. 13, 14, 15, whatever. Some of you were nine years old when you became a man. But the idea is that you train them up, and when they're old, adolescent years, they will not turn away from it. Now, parents, listen, this is not forcing them into your way. Train up the child in the way he should go. Well, by golly, I, I did music, and I played the instrument, and my grandpa did, and my dad did, and my kids are going to play that instrument. And they're all going to do it, and they're going to love it. And then you have a kid that doesn't know how to read a note of music, can't carry a tune, and you're like, get with it, we're going to get them in lessons, and you, and, you, oh, oh, and you just pile drive on them to do this, and they're like, I hate this instrument, and they want to club you with their instrument, and you can't figure out, well, I'm trying to train them up, why won't they do it? Well, no, it's because you're trying to make them go in the way you think they should go. The Bible says train them up in the way that he should go. God has wired each of your kids to kind of do their thing. They all have different talents and abilities and skills. Don't force them into what you think they ought to do. Examine your kids. Be a detective and study your kids, parents. And then you see, oh, boy, he is fast. He likes to run and jump. We're going to put him in track. <laughs> Whatever it is, you, know, you look at them and, you, and you, you kind of guide them the way that they should go. Now, it's not just athletes. It's not just music. It's talking about the way they should go. There is a way to glorify God with our talents. There's a way to do this. Our dictionary says to train means to prepare for a contest. It means to instruct by exercise. It means to drill. It means to form to a proper shape. It means to discipline for use. There are some of you that can sing very well in this place. I cannot, but I love that you can sing well. Somebody didn't say to you, I'm going to teach you, sing, 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 and you just keep teaching. You're a good singer. You can sing. No, they trained you to sing. There's training that goes in there. Some of you, you've got to be trained to read your Bible. We don't just tell you to read your Bible. We've got to train you, show you, get you in a plan, ask you how it's going, follow up, hold you accountable. Parents, we train our children. We don't just teach them. We don't just sit at the edge and teach. We get in there with them. We train them in the godly life. 
and that's important for us. And mom and dad, if you can do it together, it's so much easier. Parents, if you're going to follow the Lord, you can't be working against each other. You can't be undermining each other. Uh, if, you're, if the dad says, this is what we're going to do, and mom, you go behind his back, and you're saying to the kids, don't listen to dad, you're hurting yourself. You're cutting off your nose to smite your face. Don't do that. Honor each other. Get behind closed doors and argue it out. Fight it out. Just the two of you. Say, this or, no, we're not going to do that, honey. Yes, we are. And you guys argue it out behind closed doors. Then you come with a united front. And you say, this is what we're doing. If you try to do that in front of your kids, your kids will work every angle on you. They are smart. And they'll work you, and they'll work you, and they'll get their own way. Your kids are not meant to be the parents. Your kids are meant to submit to you and follow your leadership. How you do that is up to you. You have your own style. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. You've got your own style. But parents, if you can do this together, it'll be so much better. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. It starts with a commitment. Very quickly in closing, training up children. There's discipline. How do you discipline? Talk about it behind closed doors. There should be discipline. There should be discipline. If you don't discipline your kids, you don't love them. That's what the Bible says. Well, I've never spanked my kids because, you know, I love them so much. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if you, if, if you love them, you'll discipline them. God loves us, therefore he disciplines us. Boundaries. Give your kids boundaries. It's okay to have boundaries. It's okay to have boundaries. You can't just let them do whatever they want and think it's going to be okay. Set boundaries. Do your best. Friends. Oh, choose your friends cautiously. That's a big one. Quality time, giving them time. Relationships with Jesus. Show them how to have a relationship with Jesus. This is so practical. You go, this is easy. Well, yeah, it's fundamentals of faith, right? To have strong families, we've got to practice the fundamentals. If we're going to say we're going to serve the Lord, we've got to be practical. And as I was preparing this message, I was just saying, Lord, how, how can I show this? How can I talk about this? And I, I just sensed that Today, we need to be very practical to give some parents some actual handles to say, what does it mean to train up your child? Well, get a Bible. I've got one right here like this, a hardback Bible, and you read that to them every day. Short story, three minutes at the most. Amen. You go on. All through the day, you're talking to them about Jesus. See, this is training up a child, and it's saying in your heart, today and tomorrow and the next day, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Give them chores. Work them. Work them. Don't let them work you. Parents, work your kids. Give them chores. Teach them a work ethic. That will save them a lot of time when they get older, of going from here to here, not having jobs. And this. Teach them a work ethic. Tell them to stay at it. Finish the job. You go, Phew. Is that really in the Bible? Well, the Bible says that we are to work. God placed us in the Garden of Eden to work. And if we let our kids get by without working, we're doing them a grave disservice. Teach them to work. Give them guidance. When they ask, give it to them. When they don't, give it to them. You're giving them guidance all the time. In a way, they will hear you. And then lastly, this is the hardest one of all, intentionality. Just stay at it, stay at it, stay at it, stay at it. Any of you ever get tired of raising kids? Raise your hand. Some of you are so tired you can't even raise your hand right now. You're like, uh -huh. Your kids wear you out, don't they? They, they? they just plumb wear you out. I used to think my parents would talk to me and give me advice about how to raise my kids. And I was like, oh, that's so good. Why don't you have the kids? You, you need to do it. You're smart. You, I keep making all these mistakes. Dad, Mom, what? They said, well, we've got the wisdom now, but we don't have the energy. It's like, well, yeah, I, I need some wisdom here. That's why you have parents. That's why you talk to the godly counsel of the church and say, I need help. My kid is head, headed toward hell and fast. What do I do? And you get people around you to encourage you to help. It's intentional is what I'm getting at. Be intentional. Be intentional. You may not be able to do all those, but pick one of those and just say, you know what? Husband, wife, what are we going to do? I've heard of one family, they, they printed out chores. Each kid had 12 chores printed out. And they all had to do their chores every week. And they were paid like a dollar a week or something. I mean, it was just nothing. And you teach your kids chores. Pick out one of those. Say, what do we need to do? Where are we, where do we, where are we failing? What would, be a, what would stop the leak in the dam fastest? What could we do? It's for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. It's a commitment, folks. It's not for the faint of heart. 
love this couple back here, going to have a baby, have a shower for them this afternoon, 2 o'clock. And God bless them. Baby on the way. They're going to need help. They're going to need strength. People are saying, why did you do this? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> they need help. They need encouragement. We've got to love on them and show them and help them. We're going to dedicate a baby this morning. Oh, my word. Beautiful thing to do, to dedicate a child to the Lord. They're being intentional. We're going to follow Jesus. We're going to teach our kids to follow Jesus. I want to close with a story. There was a dad, and he was an attorney, and uh, he had several kids, and he, he, he got a big uh, dump truck of rocks that he had dumped in his backyard. And he had them there, and he did it on purpose. It was not for decoration. It was for discipline. And so when his kids would do something wrong, he'd say, get out in the back and move the rocks from one side of the yard to the other. And they knew they had to do it. They pick up these rocks. They'd carry them across. So it'd take about an hour to get the rocks moved from one side of the yard to the other. Well, this one son had lied about something, and the attorney dad said, you're not going to lie in this house. Get out there and move the rock pile. All right, dad. He goes out there, and he's just kind of sad about it, moving those rocks. And his wife said to him, honey, I thought you said you took out the trash. He said, I did. She said, no, you missed two trash cans out of three. You told me you took out the trash. He went, well, I, I did take out the trash. She said, you're deceiving me. What, what's your son doing in the backyard right now? Well, he's out there because he lied. <laughs> he went, you're right, honey. He went out in the backyard. His son was on one side. He picked up a rock, and he's going across, and his son passed him. His son's like, Dad, what are you doing? Son, I broke the same commandment you did. I'm moving the rocks with you. I'm helping you. And he helped his son. They moved the rock from one side to the other. That son learned an invaluable lesson. That son learned, this is serious. My dad is even going to be rebuked by what he doesn't do. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord.